solving systems of linear equations. Again, like I said just here at the beginning, one, substitution, two, elimination. You should be at this point of your life being given a system of linear equations of any length, how cruel I want to be, 10 by 10, 100 by 100, you should be able to solve this by substitution or elimination. All right, those are techniques we should know. Now we take this and say, all right, we studied elimination a little bit, and studying elimination led to these ideas of equivalent systems. Equivalent systems simply means same solution set. Two systems of equations of any form. It's like, hey, what's the answer to this? In other words, what values make all the equalities true? If I have one problem that says, hey, look, it has the point one, two, three, and the point four, five, six. And I have another person who says, well, this looks like a different set of equations, but its solution is one, two, three, and four, five, six. It's like, okay, we're going to call these equivalent. Same solution set, it's going to be equivalent systems. They might not look exactly identical, but they at least spit out the same solutions. So from that, the whole idea is if I have a system of equations, can I make something that's equivalent where I can read the answer? So you know, the concept would be something like this. You might start off with the problem like x plus y plus z is equal to 3 and 2x minus y minus z is equal to 0 and x plus 3y minus z is equal to 3. You have a system of equations 3 by 3 that you were trying to solve. And then somehow you do some work and you end up that you have that x equals 1, y equals 1, z equals 1 is your equivalent system. What's the solution to the thing on the right? One, one, one. That's the solution set. If I do work that keeps the system equivalent, then it should have the same solution set. Just so you know, this is one of the ways a teacher can make up cheaty problems. In my mind, it says, I want a nice, easy answer. One, one, one. So what do you think I did? What's one plus one plus one? Three. Three. Uh, what is two minus one minus one? What's one plus three minus one? All right, it's an easy way to do that. <laughs> it's like, I know I'm going to have a nice, easy answer that you eventually do, so I can quickly. In other words, you do this in your head and then say, if those are my answers, let's make a real simple or a system of equation, however you want to do it. You put some fractions in this, whatever you want. It's just a way that you know teachers get by with giving you problems, or you can make up your own problems. You should be able to get good enough to do this. Like make a problem, turn it into a system, solve it, and say, does it give it to me? And hand it to a friend and torture them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you do it. Why don't you make up one? You do it. You want to know how to know you, you learned it? But you can teach it to somebody else. Like, I don't know how to do elimination. Show somebody else how to do it. And you'll learn it. So go get a job in the math lab. And if not, <laughs> go to the math lab and help people with algebra just for fun. It's like, I'm volunteering today. <laughs> so the big issue here is what do I do so that I don't mess up the solution set? Right? The things that you do under elimination so that you don't mess anything up, if you want to say equivalent, then what we do is we can do things like interchange equations. 
it's pretty obvious if I would go back to this problem here where I have three equations, and if I decided to put the z equals one first, or the y equals one last, or who cares? Just start switching the rows. It's not going to change the solution. The solution is going to be one, one, one. So that's not going to cause any problems. Just go ahead and rearrange the rows all you want. It's not going to change your solution set. Uh, the second thing that you can do is that you can multiply an equation by a non-zero. All right. It's easiest to look at this problem right here. If I multiply this top something by non-zero, let's make it multiplied by two, does it change the solution? Absolutely not, x is still one. What happens if I multiply it by zero though? It completely wipes it out, I get zero equals zero, which has an infinite number of solutions. It's like, okay, don't do that. Right? Don't do things that cannot be undone. That's the whole purpose behind this. So that's something we can do. And the third is probably one of the ones that you'd want to maybe argue with yourself a little bit. It's like, okay, why is this true? But you can play around with it a little bit. Is that you can take an equation, add it to some multiple of another equation, and go ahead and make a new equation to replace into that system. We can spend a little bit of time on that, and the, the text does it, but it's one of the things that we do in normal algebra is we say, okay, I'm going to take this equation times something, add it to this equation, and go ahead and replace that equation. Now, this is what is all review up to this point, and you should be able to do all of that work on any particular problem. What becomes new a little bit is the idea of shorthand notation, which is to introduce the idea of matrices. So, same matrix. A matrix is go simply going to be a rectangular array of now it can actually be of anything, right? You could say hey, this is a matrix of functions, this is a matrix of things. But for our class, we're normally going to have a it's a matrix, a rectangular array of real numbers. So that's a very specific thing that exists. It's a rectangular array of real numbers now. In application, where this came from was trying to solve systems of equations. And a system of equations ended up spitting up the coefficient matrix. And then you have the other side, which is our constant, our constant, well, I'll call it a matrix. Normally, a, a one one row, many column, or a many row, one column gets its own name, which would be vectors. But vectors are matrices. Matrices are any rectangular array. So obviously, that actually is a rectangle. That's a rectangle. It's just one dimension on one of them as we take it out like that. So now from this, if I would go ahead and keep the a correct order for the x's and the y's and the z's or however you want to work this out. You just don't write x, y, and z. You keep the columns as meaning. And then my equation operations become row operations. And so the row ops have the exact same concept. We can interchange rows. We can multiply a row by a non-zero. In three, I can take a row plus some multiplier of a row and get a new row. So we stopped last class <coughs> at this particular point. Now, the goal of any of these problems The goal of elimination is to back solve. 
So I have a particular problem and I look at it, and the concept of back solving would be to, you start off with your, say your starting system. We do go ahead and do our equation, our equivalent operations, right? So equivalent systems until I get something where a system looks like this. Say x plus y plus z is equal to one. Let's say 3y minus z is equal to 2, and then 3z is equal to, say, 3. So I had something at the beginning. I start doing equivalent ops for the sole purpose of getting to the place of back solving. The way back solving works is you look at the bottom. It's a single equation of one variable. And you look at the one above it. It's a single equation of two variables, but the guy below tells me what z is. So it's not really an equation of y and z, it's an equation of y, because z is known. And so you look at this and say, oh, wait a second. From here, z is equal to 1. But if z is equal to 1, that and that are actually 1. So my system is not a 3 by 3. It has been reduced down to, the first equation is this x plus y plus 1 is 1, and 3y minus 1 is 2. It's actually 2 by 2. But if I look at this, what's y? It's also 1. But if it's 1, that means I can get it up all the way up there. And if I have that all the way up there, if I plug a 1 into that, then this is actually x plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 1. And so what's x? So x is equal to minus 1. And how do we write our solution? The solution is minus 1, 1, 1. So I'd like to get to the point of back solving, because back solving is just solve the bottom, plug it into the others, and it just simply goes backwards if we want. Strictly speaking, to get to back solve, this is where section 1.2 comes into play, is how do we get a system into row echelon form to back solve? So I start off with a system like that problem right there. And I think most people, when you look at that, you're like, I can't just tell you the answer. There's some work I ought to do to tell you the answer. But boy, if it looked like this, I could tell you the answer. And so what work do I need to do to get it from one into something where you can either back solve to tell the person the answer or just read it to tell them the answer? How do I get that? What is the process to actually make that happen? Now, the first thing is the form that we have where it has this triangular looking thing is called ro is row echelon form. So what is row echelon form? The definition of row echelon form is one, the first non-zero row entry is a one. That's the first thing that we would like to happen. And so as I look at this from left to right, the first non-zero coefficient I see is a one. So I could see like no x's, no y's, 1z. Or no x's, 1y, 5z's. Right? The very first thing you run into is a 1 coefficient as you move from left to the right for any of the rows. The second thing that you would like to do is the triangular part. And so the only way to have this thing be triangular where we have things to the left start going away, when, when I look at this, I'll notice that if I go down, and those are zeros and zeros, is that as you go down, there's more zeros than where you were. So I have all these zero entries. So if I go down, I get more zero entries than above. In other words, I can't take 
say this row here like that, that would not be row echelon form. Why? Because the one above it has more zeros than it does. It just really says as you step down, go to the right. And if you want to put it in layman's terms. And so number of leading zeros of one row is more than row above it. Unless you have all zeros. Well, what happens if you have all zeros? All zero rows are at the bottom. So if I stack this thing, I want to have things that everything's been eliminated all at the bottom. So it does go down until finally it's just all the zeros. What if I have an all zero row right on the second row? Start moving it down. Well, how can I move it down? Interchange rows. So our goal has become doing this in matrix form. So what do I want to do? I have a system of linear equations. I want to turn this into an augmented matrix. I want the coefficients, and then I want my constants on the other side. I then want to do our row operations. What do row operations do? They form equivalent systems. It's not going to change the solution set. It just hopefully gets to something where I can read the answer. And if we do row operations until we get to a row echelon form, and we'll still have just simply constants on this side. I don't know what they are going to be. No, I really don't care. It's the, co it's the coefficients that matter as I look at this thing. And then once it's in this form, you can solve by back solve. All right, if you do this, This is called Gaussian elimination. So Gaussian elimination is this idea of starting off with your system, go ahead and put it into row echelon form to something that you can actually back solve. That process of those row operations is Gaussian elimination. Now there's a question about Gaussian elimination just like every other, like a lot of mathematical techniques, right? An awful lot of mathematical techniques don't give you a very fixed, this is what you are going to do, right? It gives you a goal. This is where you're at, this is where you're gonna go. How do I do that? Well, you have these three tools to do it. Well, how do I do it? That's up to you. Figure it out, right? There's things like this. If I would give you a problem that would say 7x cubed plus 2x squared minus x plus 1 is equal to 0, and I said, solve this. This is completely different than if I gave you a problem that was 2x squared plus x minus 7 equals 0, and I said, solve that. Most people, when you would look at this, would pattern match. Quadratic. Oh, how do I solve quadratics? Quadratic formula. I don't need to think. I shall plug in the numbers 2, 1, and negative 7 in the appropriate place of the quadratic formula, x is equal to negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. I don't have to think, I just have to do it. But on the other hand, that's a cubic. Solve it. Well, should I go online? Well, wait a second, there is a cubic formula. Why don't we ever teach it? Because it's long. <laughs> what about the quartic formula? Why don't we teach it? It's probably about three or four pages long. What about the fifth? All right, after a while, guess what? No polynomials have formulas, and you can prove it. In other words, well, then how do I solve it? That's a very good question. 
I look at the coefficients. They're, they're, those guys are real numbers, and so in there, okay, that means I have, since this is going to be this, that if I would have rational solutions, which are an integer over an integer solution, it would have to be the factors of the, the, of the constant with the factors of the lead coefficient and ratio to each other. I'm going to check all of those and see if any of them work. If none of them do, then I'm not going to have rational solutions. They're going to have to be real, like square root 2. How do I find that? That's a good question. You can approximate. What if I accidentally find one? Well, I can factor it out and reduce this from a cube to a quadratic and then use a formula. I may remember things like that. It's like, what are all the possible rational solutions? How many possible positive solutions are there to this? Anyone even know how to check those? No? Like changes in sign? It goes plus. If this was all pluses, plus, 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 plus. Is there any possible way by plugging in positive numbers? that plus, 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 plus would spit out zero. No, so there's, I mean, there's no positive solutions. Okay, but what if I plug in negatives? Well, that would be negative, but that would be positive. That would be negative, that would be positive. That means, well, that becomes one sign change, one sign change, one. So there's one, two, three sign changes. Well, three sign changes, that means add or subtract. There's a possibility of having three negative solutions or one. Why is there two different? Because if I don't have negative solutions, it has to be, anybody know? What if it's not real? It has to be imaginary, which means it's complex, and complex solutions become in pairs. A plus bi, a minus bi. College algebra is starting to flash through your head a little bit. Mm -hmm. We're going to know something like this, because guess what? We're going to do polynomial space. And so certain things are going to have to come along with these sorts of stuff. And it's like, oh my goodness, I don't remember. But. Some things are process-based, and some things are spit-out answer. This is process-based. And how do I do Gaussian elimination? Well, let's say we go back to this problem here. Mm -hmm. So paste. So we get this guy. It's like, okay, I would like to solve this, and I, can use, well, I could use substitution elimination. Guess what? I'm not going to show you, but I definitely expect once we solve this thing by matrix techniques of Gaussian elimination, I expect that everybody should go home and solve this by substitution and solve this by elimination and convince yourself you know how to do it. It's a tool. All right, what does this look like as a matrix? What's the first row? What's the next row? What's the next row? And then where the equality is one, we write the augmentation. Now, Gaussian elimination has a goal. Make the first non-zero object you see a one. Yay, it is. Uh, what would you do, what would be the easiest thing for you to do if the problem rather looked like this? If the rule was make your first rows, first non-zero entry a one, what would you do? Just switch. We could just switch the rows. That's one thing we could do. We could go back to the way I had it, right? Just switch the rows. But if it actually looked like this, we could other we could do other things. What else could I do? Could I multiply row one by a half? Mm -hmm. Sure. If I multiplied row one by a half, that'd be one. Now that'd be one minus one half minus one half and zero. What's the problem? Will this have the same solution? Absolutely. Will this be a little bit harder? Maybe. Are you good at fractions? Sometimes you want to avoid fractions <laughs> as long as possible because you struggle with fractions. right? That's up to you to know on how good you are at fractions in your head. Especially if you have to say things like, hey, let's multiply this by 7 and add it to 5. What is negative 7 halves times 5? That's a very, I'm sorry, added to 5. Okay. okay, five would be ten halves, and ne okay, <laughs> it's like, yeah, and you have to do that in your head. On the other hand, you said subtract. What would be another thing that we could do instead of just simply multiplying it by a half? If I wanted to, and we're allowed to do this, I could take row one and do what? Subtract row two, which is a negative one of row two, and then can make a new row one. So if I took row one minus row two, what would that become? One. 
Negative two. Zero. Negative two. <laughs> Negative three. All right. Why is that a little more difficult? Because minuses carry through, and I've got to keep track of the subtraction and everything else. All right. Just on this line right here, and guess the other rows do not change. But if you did this, and you said, I took row one minus row two and equals a new row one. What did you do? You did four multiplications, four additions that were really subtractions, and your issue of your multiplication, since it was a minus one, was a distributing of a negative, which you sometimes leave out. Okay, I did four multiplies, four arithmetic operators, that's eight, to make one row, and I didn't even change the others for the sole purpose of making a one. In a row interchange, taking a half, doing this, every one of those matrices would look different. This matrix, this matrix, this matrix look completely different. They have the exact same solution set. Why? Because I didn't screw up my row ops. I multiply half correctly. I subtract it correctly. I interchange rows correctly. Now, how fun is this when you guys get to work together and you do different paths? Is there any rule for what you're supposed to do? Absolutely not. Think about how awesome this is on grading. <laughs> Everybody, some people just have a, a particular technique. I'm not even going to think. I'm just going to multiply that by a half. I'm going to multiply that by a third. A bit, you could have just pivoted <laughs> faster. And I'll do things like I'll, I'll try to make a problem that I know is quick. And then all of a sudden it's like, nope. It's like, oh, you did it the hardest way possible. And that's 40 hours long. So it doesn't matter what you pick. But we continue on. Okay, once I get a one, which one do you want to pick? So this one was one half row one equals new row one, and this was just simply swap the two rows. So which one do you want to go on from here? So now think about this. One matrix became three possibilities, but I could pick any one of these three possibilities with another <laughs> list of things we could do to make a big tree of possibilities. Which one do you want to do? Anybody? First one. The first one? Yeah. So you don't like fractions? <laughs> okay, so let's say we have this one right here. Um, that guy. This problem, if you print out this PDF instead of actually like <laughs> going through this class, this would be really ugly looking, wouldn't it? And so, so let's use this one. Okay, Aug what needs to happen next? I need to start knocking zeros below to put this into row echelon form. And this is why we want a 1. If this is a 1, life is so much better to make other things 0. What would I multiply 1 by so that when I added it to 1, it became a 0? Negative 1. Right? Now, if this was a 7, what would I multiply 1 by to add it to 7 to make a 0? Negative 7. So. And you could do both those steps, but it's easier to just do both of them in your head, right? You're going to say, okay, 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 3, and I'm going to say that I'm going to take row 2, essentially minus row 1 equals new row 2. I'm going to say row 3 minus row 1 to make a new row 3. Now, people would say, well, what, why don't I do 2 and 3? That's not the row you're using to knock the others out. You have the one of interest to you, which is your first big one. Use it to kill everybody below. You don't use anybody below to mess with anybody below, ever. You say, this is the one I'm using, and I'm going to knock out the guys below it. So you don't do things like, I want to take row two and row three. No, no, no. Use row one, because row one's done, to knock out two and three. And if I do that, what would row two become? What's row 2 minus row 1? Zero. 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 Negative 1. No. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 3. 6. 6. This would be 0. 5. 
five. One. One. Six. Six. Okay. Isn't arithmetic in your head awesome? All right, now what's my goal? I go to the next row. I've eliminated this. I use this one, which is a, it's called if the one here. This is called a lead variable. The guy who has the one is the lead variable. And I've used it to knock everybody out below. Then I go to row two. Is that a one? No. So what could I do? I could do things like this. I could multiply two times row two and minus row three. I don't want to do that. But it would be good. If I took two row twos minus row three, would this become and get a new row two? Would it make it a one? Yes. Why would I want to do that versus just simply taking a third? If this is an int and this is an int, an int times an int minus an int, it's going to keep it int. What happens if I take a third and instead of this being a six, it was a seven? I got a fraction. <laughs> like I'm trying to avoid fractions. So you could do a little bit more complicated of one of the row ops to try and stay an in integer if it's your choice, but it doesn't matter. The whole point is normally integers are a little bit nicer than fractions for you just doing it in your head. So be careful a little bit. But for us, if we look at this, obviously, instead of doing it that way, since that's a six, I can go ahead and say I'm just going to take one third row two to become a new row two. And this becomes one, negative two, negative two, negative three. 0, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 5, 1, 6. Okay. Now what? This is a 1. It's now a lead variable, right? So 1 is the first 1 here that exists. I'm going to use him to make everybody below it a 0. What times 1 will knock out a 5? Negative 5. So I'm going to take row 2, take a minus 5, row 2, Add it to row three to go ahead and get your new row three. So row one is still one, negative two, negative two, negative three, zero, one, one, two, zero. 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 Why is this a zero? What's zero times negative five? Zero. Plus zero. Zero stays zero. <laughs> you gotta just look at it a little bit and say, okay, did I mess this up or not? Anyways. Anyways. And so that's a zero. What's the next one? <coughs> negative four. What's the next one? What's negative five times two? Negative, negative ten. It's negative ten plus six. Negative four. Negative four. And obviously, what can I do? Multiply this by a. It's not in. It's not in Gaussian elimination yet. I would have to multiply this by negative one fourth until I finally get one, negative two, negative two, negative three, zero, one, one, two, zero, zero, one, one. Now I can solve by back substitution. What's z? One. one. So from here, I say z is equal to one. But if z is one, one is, this is one times z, which means this is actually one. So if you go to the other side, then two minus one is? One, so one y is one as well. So you have y is equal to one. If if z is one, this is actually negative two. If that's one, that's actually negative two. So that's negative four. Bring it to the other side, it becomes positive four. We get x is equal to one as well. So we can back solve it. That sort of technique of going through it, you know, until, whoops, x. So we get the point one 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 again, which you already knew. That's what it was going to be. Every okay with Gaussian elimination. Now, if you want to, the back solve part, the back solve part is to simply say that well, if z is one, I back solve up above. But how does that work? Well, if z is one, this here is actually one times z, which becomes one. But then it has to go to the other side, which means subtract it across, right? So there's a subtraction event going on. And if I subtract it over, how much is left on this side? that becomes a zero. And it became minus of what that was. And then if this is a one, that is z times one, that's a negative two, and I would add it to the other side. But if I add a two to the other side, what's left here? 
that's also a zero. So back solving is still row operators, but instead of making zeros below, you start at the bottom and make zeros above. And if you choose to go that way, in other words, continue in the matrix rather than just simply, okay, I can back solve in my head, keep the work in your matrix and make zeros above each of those lead variables. This is called Gauss-Jordan. And that, so Gauss-Jordan, instead of Gauss says, stop here. Gauss-Jordan For Gauss-Jordan, it says, let's take this last thing that we had. 1, negative 2, negative 2, negative 3, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 0, 0, 1, 1. And then we're going to use the lead variables starting at the bottom, and we're going to go up and make those zeros. So how can I make this one, how can I make that one here into a zero? I would just simply say row 2 minus row 3 equals new row 2. How would I make this negative 2 a 0 using a 1? How about a row 1 plus 2 row 3's to get a new row 1? If I do that, okay, what's row 2 minus row 3? Zero, 1, zero, 1. What is row one adding two row threes? One, negative two, zero, zero, and negative one. Is everybody okay with that? So this lead coefficient has made everybody above him a zero. And then I take this next lead coefficient and make everybody above it a zero. How would I do that? row one plus two row twos to get a new row one, and that would become what? One and zero is one. This would be negative two and two, two which is zero. zero. Zero and zero is, and now negative one and two of those. One. one. What's nice about Gauss-Jordan is you get to read the answer. Mm -hmm. All right, being able to do it for this problem and going to the book and be able to do it for every one of these three by threes that you can see or two by twos that you see, go through this process over and over and over and over again until you re-get comfortable with what happens. This will be important. Anybody recognize ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else? If we've had college algebra, we normally call this the what? The identity. We don't even know why it means the identity, right? Because identities have very specific meanings. The identity is the do nothing of an operator. So for example, if I add to a number, what would not change that number? Like five plus what is still five? Zero. zero. So a plus zero is called the additive identity. Five times what is five? One. So one is the multiplicative identity. So identities aren't just identities. Their identities are an element of what with an operator. So what operator are we talking about? Oh, we're going to have to wait a little bit. But we have to be able to do these, uh, these to actually solve systems of equations. Now, if you solve, there are three possible answers. The first possible answer you have is that you could have zero solutions. This is also called inconsistent. An inconsistent system has no solutions. Again, if we think of this in terms of the idea of lines in space that are supposed to cross, what do inconsistent systems look like? They look like parallel lines. They look like many lines that don't cross at the same place. So if you look at this and you say, they don't all cross at the same space, or they don't cross ever, 
it's an inconsistent system because we don't have any solutions. There's no one answer that is on every single line that makes every equality true. The other thing that you could have is one solution. One solution would mean that when I look at it, they cross at one place. Or what if I have a bunch of lines? They cross at one, sorry, big. <laughs> they cross at one place. So if they cross at one place, it's going to be a consistent system. So it's like, oh look, oh look, it's like, yeah, they have one place that they cross, it's a single solution. The third possibility, and this is kind of interesting, a lot of people, it's, maybe I can write the number two correctly. The third possibility is, well, we have zero, we can have one, and you would assume more, well, there's only one type of more, infinite solutions. I have an infinite number of solutions. That'd be things like two lines right on top of each other. If they have solutions at all, whether it's one or an infinite, these are called consistent. Hey, do you have a solution? Yeah, consistent. OK, now if it's consistent, how many solutions do you get? One or infinite? Now, for problems of this nature, when we look at it, you know, physically we're talking about lines in space and how they cross, and if they cross uh, everywhere, like an infinite number of times, or only once, or never at the same place, right? What does that look like in terms of matrices? Because a lot of times we don't worry about the picture version of it. That's the whole point of a matrix. The matrix is the same thing as like a quadratic equation. What is a quadratic equation? It's a polynomial. <laughs> when I set it equal to zero, what are you asking? When does this polynomial cross the x-axis? I could look at that, but the quadratic equation is like, I really don't care. I'll plug in the numbers and I can get the answers. I don't need to physically look at it. I can actually do the work. And so what's nice about a matrix? Well, it's all these lines in, OK, fine. You have five fifth dimensional lines. Can't even look at it. How about we just do the work? Is there zero? Is there one? Is there an infinite? What would the matrix look like on a problem like this? So if we would look at that and say, I'm beginning my process where I have a system of equations. And I go in here to my coefficients and my constants. And I have my augmented matrix. And then eventually, I'm going to do Gaussian elimination. OK, there are two times that you can look at this problem and have a basic understanding of what you either, the first look will be, I think I know what the answer might be. We can make a reasonable guess. After which we start to do Gaussian elimination, we can specifically say, I know what type of problem I'm going to have here in terms of no solutions, one, or an infinite as I look at it. And that'll be as you do the Gaussian elimination. So the first thing that can happen is, so one is you simply look at the first augmented matrix. So let's look at the augmented matrix, and I'm going to look at its physical shape. If we know the following thing, A, if we have more rows than columns, What's a row represent? It's an equation. What's a column represent? Variables. Variables. And I'm looking at, in particular, columns. This is of the coefficient matrix, right? If you have more rows than columns, we have more equations than variables. All right, let's look at a two-dimensional problem. If I have two lines, they tend to cross. But what would happen if you started to have more lines? What do you think that, in general, they'll start to do? Typically, they won't cross all at the same place. That would be very, very rare. So if we look at this and say, you know what? If you have too many equations, I bet the answer is going to be 0. I bet it's inconsistent. And if it is, we call it overdetermined. You have too many equations. 
And so if there's more equations than variables, it's an overdetermined system. And it's a reasonable guess to say, I bet there's probably not going to be any solution. We would guess zero solutions. And so I'm going to guess zero solutions. Because having a bunch of lines, you know, on a dimensional space that's smaller than the number of lines, it's like, uh, I don't think this is going to cross in a whole lot of places, right? It's linear. These linear systems are probably not going to do that. Everybody okay with that? All right. Uh, does it mean that it has zero solutions? No. Just usually will, if you do the Gaussian elimination, you'll actually find that answer. The other thing that could happen is if you have more columns than rows, which means we have more variables than actual equations. Again, this is the of the coefficient matrix. I don't have to guess. I know that there are infinite solutions on this thing. Period. Here's the easiest example of why this would be true. Here's a system. How many equations? How many variables? We do these problems all the time. What is this? Uh, this is a straight line. Y is equal to negative X plus 1, which means it's this moved up. Oops, there it is. Why do I draw lines? Because there are infinite number of solutions. Every point on that line is a solution to this equation, right? And when you do this, what happens is, if I would look at it in terms of a system, what this would look like as an augmented matrix is this. One, one, augmented one, right? And then I go through this system and say, I'm gonna put a square around every lead variable. Well, what's a lead variable? I look from the left and I put a box around the first one I see. Right there, there's my lead variable. Uh, so x is a lead variable. What's y? It's not a lead variable. So if y has no lead variable in it, in its column, it's free. Which means what? It's free. It can take on any value at all and I can figure out what x is dependent upon y. It's a free variable. So when I look at this, that's a lead, but this guy is free. But what does it mean to be free? It can be anything. Any number from negative infinity to infinity, it takes on an infinite number of solutions. But if y takes an infinite number of solutions, it forces an x to be dependent on it. So it has an infinite number of pairs. So what that's forced on having more columns than rows. And the last thing is, columns equals rows, you can make a reasonable guess of one solution. Does it mean that it has one solution? Absolutely not. It could be zero, it could be one, or it could be infinite. How do I know that when I go through the Gaussian elimination? So these just, looking at the first part, you just make guesses according to size. Oh, it's square. I'm going to guess one. Why? Because most of our homework problems will have one. Oh, look, it has more equations and variables. Oh, that's overdetermined. I bet there's no solution. Well, does it have to be no solution? No. It actually could have one or infinite, right? Okay, well, what if it's, right, you keep going through this process, right? All right, and now it goes to the next part is, so the first thing is we look at the augmented matrix. The second is we would consider the steps of Gaussian elimination. And when you do that, you start doing some work, and we're going to get lead variables and some other numbers. Let's say I did something like this. 
So I start doing Gaussian elimination, and I get like an all zero rows happen. So I make sure I do a swap till it shows up at the bottom, and I do all of this work. Okay, who who are my first ones? Well, there's the first one, and there's the first one. So which equate? If this was a x y z v variable, who are my leads? X and z. So x and z are leads. So x and z are lead variables. And who are free? Y and v are free. Again, what does it mean to be free? They're free. <laughs> they can be any number between negative infinity and infinity. And so if you have free variables, you automatically know infinite solutions. So if you look at this and say, oh look, there's free variables, infinite solutions. Well then how do I write my solutions? Well, for y, it can be any number, so let's call it n1. Uh, what can v be? It can be any number, let's call it n2. Well what number is it? n2. So from here on out, wherever I see v, I'll plug in n2. And then I just start, okay, if I know that, so for example, if I said, hey, v is some number because it's free. But let's look at that equation. If v is some number, let's say n2, what does that make z? It'd be z would be equal to pi minus 2 n2. I don't care what v is, I'll know what z is because it's determined by it, it's a lead. But now do I know v and z? Yes, do I also know y? It's free, so I'm going to say, let's say n1. If that's true, what does that make x? There's some fun things to keep track in your mind. All right, I would have four v's that would have to go to the other side. So that's a minus one, minus four, and twos. And I have two y's, which are, sorry, I have three, yes, and take care of the two y's. So that would be a minus two and one. And I have three z's when they come across, it would be minus three of the z's, which is pi minus two and twos, and I could simplify that and whatever it is is x. Could you give me a single point? You know what? If you ask me for a single point, I think I'm going to be smart and pick uh, n one and n two can be anything. Yeah, let's pick zero. So if I pick zero. This becomes easy. What would be your point? Negative one minus three pi would be x, and then y would be zero. zero. Z would be pi. pi, and v would be zero. zero. But could I pick anything? Yeah, you could pick e, you could pick a million, but usually try to pick numbers that make life better. Okay, so if, it, if you see free variables at all, if there's any free, then we have infinite solutions. And how do I handle infinite solutions like that? So that's the first thing that could happen. What's the next thing that could happen? Let's say we do our Gaussian elimination. And you end up with some stuff and some stuff. And then you end up with the following equation. You have a line in here that is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and on the other side of the matrix is an augmented, say, 1. What does that say? What's the left-hand side? 0x, zero 0y, zero 0z, zero and 0v's, zero which would happen to be what? 0, zero so equals one. So, there's more variables. so if I look at this, not that there's more variables, you just did your work, and in the middle of your work, something showed up that is zero equals something not zero. And, if, and you would sit there and say, no, <laughs> it's like, that can't work. Okay, here would be an easy example. It's like, if we would look at this, it's like, ah, so we have no solution. Here's an easy example. Let's consider parallel lines x plus y is equal to 1, x plus y is equal to pi. So 
So let's put this into a matrix. 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 pi. There's my lead variable, how to make everything below it a zero. Let's just take row one minus row two equals my new row two. Remember, you're getting rid of the, if I do this, what does this become? One, 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 zero, 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 one minus pi. So what have we just said? One minus pi is the same as zero. Yeah, that's not true. This is impossible, and so we have no solution. Why has no solution occurred? This happens when you have parallel lines. Because I have this line and this line. And if I subtract the two, they're 1 minus pi apart. And that's all that's going to happen to this thing. So that's what happens where physically you have parallel lines. And when you do your work, it's just going to end up being that you get to a problem where 0 is equal to something that's not 0. That's impossible, no solution. Is everybody OK with that? So if you do your work, you get three variables, infinite. You do your work, you get 0 equals something not 0, no solutions. So there hadn't been a parallel equation somehow back in these linear systems. The third possibility is it actually goes into true 1, 1, 1 with zeros all below, and we get our constants on this side, none of which are 0, right? Because I would have at the bottom 1 equals 0. Well, so it can be zeros up above. If I would make it 0 and 0, like if I put it in Gauss-Jordan like this, if I put it in Gauss-Jordan form, and these are all constants here, then I really don't, you know, then, it, then for each of these we're okay. So you could go into Gauss-Jordan and it looks like that. This also happens if it's in Gaussian elimination and we have the same thing over here, just constants. In other words, no free variables. Everybody's a lead, it's just one straight down the diagonal. Now this can happen if, well what happens if it happened to be, what if you had an overdetermined system and how could it have a solution? Well what would happen is you would get all the bottom guys below that would just be a bunch of zeros. So what happened is it's like taking the equation and just repeating the, the problem on down. It'd be something like this. If I started with the following system, say uh, x plus y was equal to 1, and y is equal to 2, and then x plus y is equal to 1, and y is equal to 2. If you wrote this system and you did your work, it would end up being 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, but then 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. As you did it, it would start to subtract, and all of a sudden I just get a bunch of zeros. Everybody below is just a repeat. So it actually just got wiped out and it doesn't matter. And I see the elimination up above. It's overdetermined, but it has an answer. Why? Because it really wasn't overdetermined. <laughs> it's like I had an equation that showed up a bunch of times and it wiped itself out. So that sort of problem does happen. So that gives us physically, you know, why these things happen and what should happen. So when you look at the original, you can make a guess. Ah, I think there might be one, I think there might be zero, I think there might be infinite, but as you do your work, oh, free variable. Immediately you know this thing's gonna have an infinite number of solutions if I solve it. Oh look, zero equals seven, I'm done. No answer. I can go ahead and stop and say that there is no solution. Now, one of the other things that we're going to do here on systems of equation, there's a special system that we're going to run into a lot. Class ends at 45, right? So I can get my pattern going on. Yeah. Okay. Any system that has the following property, so for example, say x plus y plus z is equal to 0, 3x minus y is equal to 0, 2x plus z is equal to 0. So if you look at this system and you notice that everything on the right hand side is 0, 
and you write your augmented matrix and you get 1, 1, 1, 0, 3, negative 1, 0, 2, sorry, 0, 0, 1, 0. You need to fill it out, right? If you notice that the right-hand side of your augmented matrix is all zeros, which means your system of equations is just simply equal to zero. So we're looking at linear equation equal to zero. Any problem of this nature is going to be called homogeneous. So every equation that you see is some sort of linear expression is equal to zero. And when I put it into my augmented matrix, that means that this other side of the augmentation is just zeros. If this is true, it's going to be called homogeneous. Okay, why are homogeneous systems important? Uh, the analog is this. How do you solve polynomial equations? So if I had a problem and so what is the idea of why homogeneous systems being important? When I start to look at a system, you know, what we're trying to find is the set of points, say x, y, z, or however many variables, right? This, the group of numbers that when I plug into my variables actually makes every equality true. Now if you look at this, the entire thing on the right hand side is just simply a bunch of zeros, right? So eventually I can think of this as being the coefficients and then I'm going to have an idea of a multiplication and it spits out the other side which is zeros. So the system, the coefficient system, works on the variables and spits out nothing but zeros. We have things that are similar to that. How do you solve polynomials? And in normal college algebra, if I gave you 3x cubed plus an x times x squared minus 7 is equal to 2x minus, say, plus 2. And I looked at this and said, solve this. What would you do? You'd, simpl you'd multiply the entire thing out, move everything to one side, and set the other side to zero. Why? Let's say we did that, right? We'd have, how many x cubes do you see? I see four x cubes. How many x squareds do you see? I see no x squareds. How many x's do you see? Negative nine. And how many constants do you see? Two. Everybody okay with that? Why did we do this? Because polynomials can be written as a multiplication of what? Since it's a three, that's a third degree polynomial, this eventually could be written as a something, 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 where this is an x plus something, an x plus something, and an x plus something, right? Eventually worked out with the constant on the outside, which I could take a four out, is equal to zero. What am I taking advantage of? Factoring and the fact that zeros dominate. How many solutions are there? Three. Why? Because this would be something times something times something equals zero. The only way this works is if the first thing could be zero, the second thing could be zero, or the third thing could be zero. Because zero is a multiplicative dominator. And so we use that to solve these systems. In other words, we use the fact that zero times anything spits out a zero. So zero objects are, are really, really powerful. They destroy things, right? We've talked about this several times. Now, for a homogeneous system, 
when I look at it, there's an answer that is absolutely obvious. Remember, you can plug in any number you want to for x, y, and zero, z, right? What would happen if you plugged in 0, 0, 0? Would it work? Yeah. It always works. <laughs> Homogeneous systems have a very trivial solution. 0, 0, 0. Plug in all zeros, it's obviously going to do what? Make it 0. That's called the trivial solution. In other words, it's never inconsistent. It's always consistent. But there's two types of consistencies. You have exactly one solution, which would have to be what? Zero, zero, zero. Or you could have an infinite number of solutions, which are things besides zero, 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 which all of a sudden ought to make you start to scratch your head. You mean that there's a group of numbers that I can multiply this by, by that would spit out zero that aren't zero. That's probably the first time you've had anything in math where you would have this times this is zero, but they're not zero. In normal arithmetic, zero is the only guy that does that. All of a sudden, it's very possible for us to have a group of numbers with another group of numbers and multiply it and get zero. And those numbers weren't zeros. And so we're going to have this issue with, boy, there's something weird about this system of equations. It destroys things that happen to be, that they act like zero, yet they are not. And so we're going to have to deal with this. So the first thing that we have on this is one, all homogeneous systems are consistent and they have at least the all zero trivial solution. And the second one is going to be this question for later. And what would answer that? Remember back when I talked about Gaussian elimination? If you do the Gaussian elimination, what happens to make it have an infinite number of solutions? Free variables. So if you do your work, so you set up a homogeneous system, you know all zeros work. But you start doing Gaussian elimination on it, and you notice, wait a second, a free variable just showed up. This thing has an infinite number of solutions, not just the trivial solution. And so it's going to be a matrix, it's going to be a coefficient matrix that might be interesting to us. We're going to study more of those later. All right, that's it.